Hello, everyone. I'm Justice Matt DeLort, and I serve on the Appellate Court of Illinois, First District. I'm happy to be with you today with the cooperation of the Chicago Bar Association to give a brief presentation on appellate practice, with particular emphasis on practice here in Cook County before the Appellate Court for the First District. In today's presentation, I'll cover about six main points. I'll begin by explaining the structure of the Illinois Appellate Court. Then I'll discuss lawyering skills, which will help you become a more effective advocate in our court. Some of those skills involve a motion practice before the Appellate Court and understanding the court's jurisdiction. In other words, the limitations on when you can bring an appeal to the court. I will also cover some hints regarding preparation of the record on appeal and conclude by explaining some of the most common errors we see in appellate briefs. The Illinois Appellate Court is established by the Constitution of 1970, and in particular Article 6 of the Constitution. Contrary to popular belief, there is actually only one appellate court in Illinois. It sits, however, in five different districts, which are shown on the map to the right of the screen. The first district is Cook County, and then you see the other four districts. The second district's courthouse is in Elgin, the third district's courthouse is in Ottawa, the fourth district in Springfield, and the fifth district in Mount Vernon. The court, however, sits in panels of three justices. In other words, three justices sit to hear every particular case before the court. And a concurrence of the majority of the three is necessary for a valid decision to be issued. The workload of the appellate court, of course, is generated by the appeals filed by various litigants and their attorneys. According to statistics published by the Administrative Office of Illinois Courts, there are about 250 pending cases per justice for the first district in Cook County and about 125 cases per justice in the other districts. Those figures, however, are a bit misleading because at any given moment, I don't have 250 cases sitting on my desk. I may have five, I may have 10, I may have an, another number in that range, uh, as do my colleagues. However, there are many cases that are in the pipeline that are waiting to be heard, um, not necessarily waiting for a judge to get around to them, but they are, are in various stages of completion because the record has not been filed yet, the docketing statement is not due yet, or the case is in the middle of briefing, or the case is under advisement after an oral argument. In the end, uh, a justice in Cook County like myself probably authors about 100 opinions, Rule 23 orders, or summary orders per year. Under state law, each justice of the Illinois Appellate Court has a staff of three persons, two of whom have to be licensed attorneys. The third person does not have to be a licensed attorney, but many justices will often hire an attorney for the third position and simply have a staff of three law clerks rather than two law clerks and a secretary. Each district of the appellate court also has a large staff of attorneys who constitute the court's research department. Depending on the district, cases are assigned to the research department for review, analysis, study of the record, and preparation of a, uh, a memo which can be turned into an opinion. In the first district, the cases that are handled by the research attorneys in the first instance are generally simple one-issue criminal cases. However, once they go up to the uh, assigned justice after being worked up by the research department, they can be completely rewritten by the authoring justice according to his or her preferences before the case is sent for review by the entire panel. Another common misunderstanding is that the Illinois Appellate Court is bound to follow its own precedents. This is not necessarily correct. My court is bound by the doctrine of stare decisis only to follow decisions of the United States Supreme Court and the Illinois Supreme Court. We are not bound by decisions of other appellate courts of Illinois or even 
um, I should say, other districts of the appellate court, or by the home district. Regardless of how current that decision is, how recent it is, or even if it's written by the same author. Similarly, the Illinois Appellate Court is not bound by decisions of federal district courts or federal courts of appeal. We may find that those decisions are helpful with respect to their analysis. We may find them persuasive, but we are not bound by them. Nor, of course, are we bound by a lower court such as a circuit court in Illinois. The Illinois Appellate Court receives, as, as I mentioned, hundreds and hundreds of cases a year. When a case is ready, and that's the term of art we use in our court, which means that the case has been fully briefed. There is a white appellant's brief, a blue appellee's brief, and a yellow reply brief, or the time has passed for one or more of those briefs to be submitted. At that point, the clerk's office will make the case a ready case, and it will be randomly assigned to an authoring justice. There is an exception to that rule, and that is if the case comes in and the clerk notices through a review of the party's names and the circuit court number that it's related to a previous appeal, then the case is automatically assigned to the same authoring justice who did the previous case. The author will generally decide whether or not the case should be set for oral argument. Of course, the full panel, upon review of a draft opinion, might decide to also set it for oral argument. There may be internal discussions regarding whether the case really needs to be set for oral argument. But from time to time, the various justices will place cases on an oral argument calendar. After the authoring justice has finished working on the case, the authoring justice will circulate a draft. It could be an opinion a Rule 23 order, or a summary order to the two other justices who are also randomly assigned to be on the panel. In the first district, the other two justices on the panel will be justices who sit in the same division as the authoring justice. However, in the other downstate appellate court districts, the court basically sits as a whole for purpose of assignment of cases, and every justice might sit with any other justice depending on the randomization of the particular case. If a case is set for oral arguments, the panel will always meet after the oral argument to discuss the case and reach a consensus as to how the opinion or other dispositional order should be written. If a case is not set for oral argument, the panel still might meet in chambers uh, to work out uh, touchy or difficult issues or work out language in a draft that is not satisfactory to one or more of the justices. The caseload of the appellate court, according again to statistics published by the administrative office, shows that the caseload is about 55% criminal and 45% civil. Again, statistics can be a bit misleading because on the average, the civil cases are much more complex than the average criminal case. That's not to say we don't get criminal cases with, with a number of issues that pose difficult questions for us. But by and large, the, the workload of the justices in the first district in chambers is disproportionately related to civil cases because many of the one issue or simpler criminal cases will be worked up in the research department first. If you are going to handle an appeal on behalf of a client before the Illinois Appellate Court, it's important to keep in mind a number of important lawyering skills. The first one is the Notice of Appeal. The Notice of Appeal is jurisdictional and it must be filed in the circuit court within 30 days of the order being appealed. That, of course, is the final and appealable order being appealed. Once the case is concluded with a final and appealable order, preliminary orders might also be heard in the appellate court uh, if you believe the court erred in, for instance, denying um, a, a discovery issue. It's important in the notice of appeal to precisely identify 
the specific orders being appealed. You normally do this by date. You would, for instance, say the orders of April 1, 2012, May 13, 2013, and then the final and appealable order of July 1, 2017. There's a second necessary document, which is the docketing statement. Unlike the notice of appeal, the docketing statement is filed with the appellate court rather than the circuit court. And it's important to keep in mind as well that there is no need to argue your case in the notice of appeal or the docketing statement. It simply is an aid for the clerk of the court to set up a, a case number. Uh, no one is going to be reading this with respect to any arguments you make about the merits of your appeal. Another thing that would be helpful, particularly if you have not handled a number of appeals, is to obtain the Handbook on Civil Appeals published by the Illinois Institute for Continuing Legal Education, or as lawyers and judges like to call it, ICL, I-I-C-L-E. That book is a comprehensive encyclopedia of the rules regarding how to handle a civil appeal before the Illinois Appellate and Supreme Court. The book covers jurisdiction of the court, the appealability of orders, topics regarding brief writing, and much, much more. I would also recommend that an attorney handling an appeal for the first time in the Illinois Appellate Court review the local rules of the judicial district in which the appeal is being brought. These are published widely in legal handbooks and are also available on the Illinois Courts website. Another major issue is this. If you're the appellant, in other words, you lost in the circuit court, and you have perfected your appeal, and you have filed your appellant's brief, now the clock is ticking for the other side, which is the appellee, the side that won in the circuit court, to file its brief. We often see a number of appellee's briefs, and these are the briefs with the blue covers, start out with a recitation that the appeal should be dismissed because the appellant has made some sort of procedural error, particularly with respect to the record. Um, for instance, the appellant might seek review of the result of a jury trial, but the appellant has not included the transcript of the trial and instead is relying on his or her own representations of what occurred at the trial. For our, from our standpoint, as judges of the appellate court, that kind of appeal is impossible to review. We have an insufficient record because we don't take the lawyer's word for what occurred at the trial. Instead, we need to see the transcript of what the testimony was at the trial and what evidence was admitted. If the appellee says in their brief that you made a procedural error, take the hint and fix the problem. It may be the kind of thing where you can ask to supplement the record with additional material uh, that rectifies the problem. Sometimes it's the kind of problem that can't be rectified by simply supplementing the record. But the worst thing to do is to ignore what the appellee says when you can fix it and instead in your yellow reply brief argue that the error is actually not an error and didn't need to get fixed because uh, there is almost certainly going to be a bad result for you when my court issues its final dispositional order and says that the appeal has to be dismissed because of failure to provide necessary information. Also, remember, the appellate court's a little different than the circuit court. We don't send out necessarily reminders of due dates of things. It's your job to keep track of when things are due, and our clerk's office will help you with that with a simple phone call. In some time in the future, when the court website um, becomes updated um, and revised, there may be a procedure, like in the federal courts, to give reminders of due dates, but currently that's not working uh, in at least all of the districts. Also, limit your extension of time requests. The court likes to keep on a schedule, and the court likes to resolve cases in reasonable time periods. If you request 
five, six, seven extensions of time, that's not going to be looked on favorably. And there actually is an unwritten rule that the court is unwilling to grant more than three extensions of time on most cases for filing of a brief by a party. If you won in the circuit court and you're the appellee, you should file an appearance in the appellate court right away so that the court clerk's office knows who you are and has contact information. So if there are any motions that are filed or any notices to be sent out, the court clerk knows to whom those notices should be directed. Also, remember, some appeals, such as child custody appeals, juvenile cases, Supreme Court Rule 311 automatically expedite those cases, and it requires our court to issue rulings within 150 days from when the notice of appeal was filed. If you think about it and work those days out in the court rules, that basically does not give any time for extensions to file the record or extensions to file the brief. And the court would like to have all the briefs in before it starts writing an opinion or dispositional order. So if, for instance, you're a divorce attorney and the underlying appeal deals with anything regarding child custody, be very careful before asking for extensions of time because if you are going to be granted one, it will be a very, very short extension so that the court can keep on track and issue its ruling within 150 days from when the notice of appeal was filed. Each appellate court district, one through five, has an appellate court clerk based out of the courthouse. As I say on the slide here, the appellate court clerk is your friend. The court clerk's offices are relatively small, unlike the circuit court clerk's offices, and it's very easy to call and have an actual person answer the phone, and you can inquire about the status of your case or about any impending deadlines. Just make sure you have the case number handy. Another thing that the court clerk's office can help you with is this. After the case has been concluded and you receive the court's opinion, whether you've lost or won, once in a while there are typographical or scrivener's errors in the opinion. On page 14, the court may have said plaintiff when it's clear from the context that the word defendant should have been used. It's perfectly proper to send a letter to the court clerk pointing this kind of error out and directing it to the court. The court clerk will give it to the authoring justice so that the error can be reviewed and corrected before the opinion becomes um, published in hard copy legal publications. Similarly, if there is an error in your brief of that kind of a nature, even though you've already filed the brief, you can send a letter asking to correct that. Now that briefs are filed electronically, you could e also file a motion to file a corrected brief in Stanter, and you would not have to necessarily go through the um, procedure of reprinting your briefs on paper. If you have an emergency matter before the appellate court, such as a matter to stay a child custody order pending appeal, or an election case. You are probably going to file a motion for expedited schedule. Even though you have filed that motion, it doesn't hurt to make a phone call to give a heads up to the court clerk's office and let the court clerk know that this is an emergency case and it should be brought to the attention of the assigned justice as soon as possible. In the first district in Cook County, the court sits in six different divisions. We have 24 justices who sit in six divisions of four. As soon as the case comes to the attention of the court clerk, the court clerk randomly assigns the case to one of those six divisions. And that division will keep the case for motion purposes until the case becomes a ready case after being fully briefed. Each division has a deputy clerk who is assigned to handle all of the motions for that division. So you can always call and ask, what division is my case assigned to? 
and can you please put me on the phone with the clerk or the deputy clerk for that division? Because that clerk can tell you what's happening with your motion, if it's been received, if it's being held for a response, or there has been an order entered that maybe you haven't heard about yet. On July 1, 2017, the Illinois Appellate Court truly entered the electronic age because on that date, the requirements came into effect for filing records from the circuit court and filing briefs electronically. There is still a transition phase for this, but it's, e it's perhaps simple to say right now all filings in the appellate and Supreme Courts are made electronically with, with the exception of criminal cases, which are still um, in a phase of transition. However, for civil cases, all the filings are electronic with some very, very rare exceptions. You really should review Supreme Court Rule 361 with respect to appellate court motions. Just like circuit courts, our court hears a lot of motions. Most of the motions we hear are motions for extensions of time to file a brief or to file the appellate record. Before filing a motion in the appellate court, you should review Supreme Court Rule 361. The rule, among other things, requires that a draft order be prepared written in the alternative. What does that mean? That means that the order that you're going to draft for the court will indicate that the motion is either granted or denied with a slash between the two words granted or denied or allowed or denied. Or if necessary, you could have two separate paragraphs, one granting the motion and one denying the motion. And depending on the motion, again, there may be a blank to fill in with a due date or a deadline. The court will then have that paper order before it and then delete the inappropriate language and enter the order with only the appropriate language remaining. For right now, it's a good idea to leave three spaces for signatures of three justices on your draft orders. Some orders only require one judge's signature, but leave the three spaces just in case. The court often receives inquiries why the court has not issued an order on a pending motion yet. The answer is usually this. The Supreme Court rules provide an automatic schedule allowing the other side to respond to the motion. If the motion is hand-delivered to opposing counsel, there's five days to respond. But if the motion is mailed, which is usually what lawyers do, it's 10 days. And if the 10th day falls on a weekend or then there's a holiday, it could end up that the deadline is actually 15 days or so after the actual filing of the motion. So the, the clerk responsible may hold on to that motion if it's not obviously an emergency, waiting for a response to come in. But if the motion is a routine motion, for instance, it's a first request for an extension of time on a non-emergency case, the court may go ahead and simply act on the motion and issue the order um, upon deeming it to be a routine motion. If a late response comes in, the court will, of course, review that response and reconsider the order, depending on what the response says. It's a good idea not to rely on the mail rocks rule to meet the response deadline. Get your response into the court physically, whether it's electronically or on paper, if you're still allowed to do a paper filing, before that deadline expires, because the judge may be sitting on the original motion waiting for a response and on the 11th day go ahead and issue the order not knowing that you've chosen to mail your response by U.S. mail from a distant location. Unlike motions in the circuit court, there's not a three-step process, motion, response, reply. Because motions in the appellate court tend to be relatively straightforward, and uncomplicated, court rules do not allow a reply to be filed except by court order. And it is very common for us to deny requests to file replies 
because in almost all cases, the court can make a sound and reasoned judgment on whether the motion should be granted based merely on the motion and the response in opposition. Once a motion comes in, it will be reviewed by the presiding justice of the division or the motion panel uh, assigned to that particular case. In, in Cook County, the presiding justice of each division generally will sit to review motions on a set time every week with the deputy clerk. Um, there could be anywhere from 30 to 70 motions to review during that session. And at the conclusion of that session, the orders are sent out to the attorneys of record. In the appellate court, certain motions can be resolved by the approval of only one justice. Generally speaking, these are what might, we might call motions of course, motions for extensions of time, motions for a stay, uh, motions to file a supplemental appearance or to file a supplemental record. Those can be resolved by one signature. However, if the order would resolve the case, such as a motion to dismiss an appeal for lack of jurisdiction, then the motion must be referred to a full panel of three justices. For some motions, a supporting record is really needed or required. Keep in mind that the actual record on appeal prepared by the clerk of the circuit court might not be available when the motion justice reviews the motion. For instance, if there is a motion for a stay pending appeal, an attorney will certainly want to provide the court with a supporting record, including the order that is supposed to be stayed, the pleadings that generated that order, perhaps a transcript of the circuit court's ruling explaining why the circuit court did or did not enter the order or did or did not grant a stay. Those are all going to be helpful for the court to determine whether or not the order should be stayed. And it's important to submit legible copies of circuit court orders. We are still in an era where most circuit court orders are handwritten in the courtroom and carbon paper is used to make copies of the order. A first or a second or even a third generation copy of that order is going to have legibility issues. And we have seen supporting records and we have seen briefs where the order that's being appealed, the center focus of the entire appeal, is completely illegible because the copy is too light or the handwriting on the order is, as we say, chicken scratch. So it's very helpful in that case to give us a conformed copy of the order. What I mean by that is this. Take a legible copy of the order and type it out on a separate sheet of paper, indicate with S slash that it was signed by the judge with the date, and give us a second page right after the handwritten order saying that this is a conformed copy of the order entered on, for instance, July 1, 2016 by Judge Smith. That will be of immeasurable help to the court in deciphering what's on the handwritten order. We often get questions about taking the case on the appellant's brief only. What that means is this. There is a set schedule in the court rules regarding the filing of briefs and the timing of the three briefs that are filed on every case. For some reasons, it could be lack of money. It could be inattention. It could be a number of other reasons. The appellee fails to file a brief and the clock is ticking, the clock is ticked, and there's no appellee's brief. The appellant wants to get the case moving. So what the appellant can do, if the time has expired for the appellee to file a brief, and even an, some extra time has gone by for things getting lost in the mail, you can ask the appellate court to take the case on the appellant's brief only. What that will do, assuming enough time has gone by, the court will usually grant that kind of a motion make the case ready, and then it will be assigned to an authoring justice to review. Keep in mind 
that if only an appellant files a brief in the appellant court, that does not mean the appellant automatically wins because it's always the appellant's burden to convince the appellant court that the circuit court was incorrect, regardless of whether an appellee filed any brief. We call this the Talandis Doctrine, T-A-L-A-N-D-I-S, after a case in which the Illinois Supreme Court held that the court was still, had the, the appellant still had the burden uh, to show why the circuit court should be reversed. And we cite that case all the time in our rulings. If there is truly an emergency, perhaps with a case involving child custody or an election-related case, the court rules provide that you can ask us to expedite the case, and the court can consider whether or not the case should, in fact, be expedited. You also might wish to consider filing a motion to strike a brief filed by an opposing party. Sometimes this would be a brief filed by a pro se party, someone who's representing themselves, who doesn't understand court rules or what is really needed to be presented to an appellate court to perfect an appeal. But sometimes even briefs written by attorneys are so bad that they are faced with a motion to strike them. Rather than trying to respond to a brief that is simply um, gobbledygook, so to speak, you might want to consider asking the court to strike it and require the party to file a better brief that does contain the elements required by the Supreme Court rules. On the other hand, we will often receive motions to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. On a case where there are multiple parties and there are cross appeals and there are um, all sorts of things floating around that happen in the circuit court and it requires 25 pages to explain why the appellate court does not really have jurisdiction over the appeal. It might be better simply to raise that issue in the brief because the motion panel might believe it's better to wait for the full record to come in and for full briefing to come in before resolving that kind of a motion. However, if it's a simple one issue case and it's clear that the notice of appeal was filed 42 days after the judgment rather than within the 30-day period, that's an easy motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. And you can file that kind of a motion giving, of course, the appropriate record in support uh, along with it. And then the court can consider whether or not, in fact, the appeal should be dismissed before you have to go through the trouble of filing briefs. Keep in mind also that if you're asking the appellate court to stay in injunction order, and this includes mortgage foreclosure cases, which are in the nature of an injunction. There is, uh, the Supreme Court rules are very clear. The, the rule uses the word shall. Those kinds of orders require a bond to be stayed. Uh, similarly, money judgments will require uh, a bond of some sort. Uh, you might want to talk to the clerk's office regarding what the court normally expects in order to grant a stay in those particular cases. The appellate court, as I mentioned earlier, was created by Article VI of the 1970 Illinois Constitution. Of course, it existed before under the previous constitutions, but we are now working off of the structure established in 1970. And the Constitution provides that appeals from final judgments of a circuit court are a matter of right. So unlike the Illinois Supreme Court, that is allowed to pick and choose which cases it hears. Our court must hear and must resolve on the merits a properly perfected appeal from a final judgment of a circuit court. The term final judgment is defined in court rules and case law, and you might want to review that to make sure that you actually have a final judgment before spending time and money litigating an appeal. Our court can and must hear some appeals that are from judgments other than from final judgments. And those are established by Supreme Court rules as empowered by, again, Article 6 of the 1970 
Illinois Constitution. Examples of these include appeals from injunctions, temporary restraining orders, preliminary injunctions, of course, permanent injunctions. Those are covered by Illinois Supreme Court rules. Another common example is where an order resolves a claim or account completely against a party, and the court has determined under Supreme Court Rule 304A that that judgment may be final and appealable. Additionally, the appellate court can exercise original jurisdiction to complete determination of a case. So, for instance, if the circuit court grants one party's motion for summary judgment and denies another party's motion for summary judgment, if on review the appellate court determines to do the opposite, the court can go ahead and grant the motion that was denied in the circuit court. Also, the appellate court has the powers to review administrative action as provided by law. Almost every administrative agency's decisions are appealable on administrative review to the circuit court in the first instance. Examples would include pension boards, civil service commissions, police and fire uh, agencies, etc. However, there are a few specific administrative agencies which by law have their appeals or their administrative reviews directly appealed right to the, circ uh, to the appellate court and bypass the circuit court. One example of these is the Pollution Control Board of Illinois. Other examples include the State Labor Relations Board. So in those cases, the circuit court is completely out of the picture. The case jumps from the board directly to the appellate court, and the record is prepared by the agency instead of the circuit court, and the agency files the record with the appellate court. The next slide covers jurisdiction in a little bit more detail. We've talked about Rule 301, which provides for a review of final judgments of the circuit court. A court can add language to an order under 304A if the order is in fact final, but otherwise not appealable because there are other claims still pending. For instance, there might be an auto accident case with two defendants. One defendant wins summary judgment and is out of the case, but the other defendant is still in the case because that defendant did not move for summary judgment. To appeal the summary judgment entered in favor of the first defendant, the court would have to add 304A language to make sure that that case could be appealed. Or if the 304A language is denied or not requested, then in order to appeal that judgment, you would have to wait until the case is completely over against all the defendants. It's important to use the full, what we call the magic language, indicating that the order is final and appealable and that there's no just cause to delay enforcement or appeal. Simply putting in this is 304A is usually not going to do the trick. Similarly, 304B is where you find the source of information for interlocutory appeals by right, such as TROs, injunctions, uh, orders that grant or deny a section 214.01 petition, or where someone has been found in contempt of court and a punishment has also been imposed. We see some appeals, particularly from divorce cases, where someone has been found in contempt of court, but there has been no punishment imposed. That's not an appealable order, no matter what language is used. You need punishment to go along with it. And there are many more instances specified in those rules. Supreme Court Rule 306 turns the tables, so to speak. This is where the appellate court gets to act a little bit like the Supreme Court, where the appellate court gets to pick and choose whether or not to hear an appeal. So this kind of a case is initiated by a petition for leave to appeal or permission to appeal to the appellate court. The cases that are specified in this rule include orders such as an order granting or denying uh, uh, dismissal under form nonconvenience, 
or denying dismissal under long-arm jurisdiction, or an order disqualifying an attorney, certifying a class action, and many more. These kind of cases are not initiated by filing a notice of appeal in the circuit court. Instead, they're initiated by filing a petition for leave to appeal in the appellate court. There's a schedule. The other side will get a chance to respond. That petition will be assigned to a division, and a panel will determine whether or not to grant leave to appeal. If the petition is granted, then further briefing can be had before the appellate court on the merits of that petition. If you're going to practice in the appellate court, it's also important to understand the procedural progression rule. If you file a notice of appeal from a final and appealable order, that notice of appeal will include or encompass all the orders in the procedural progression leading to the order specified. Again, it's important not to rely on this rule, but to be specific in your notice of appeal to list every order you're going to appeal. But this rule does give you some cover. For instance, if you had a two week long trial, a jury trial, and the order um, imposing the judgment based on the jury's verdict was entered on May 31st, but you really want to raise on, the, on appeal issues that occurred in the course of trial or in respect to motions in limine in April or May 6th or May 12th. Those were usually orders that are in the procedural progression leading up to the final jury verdict and the judgment on the jury verdict, so they are included. But the clock there on the right side of the slide, if you notice, is a backwards clock. That's how this works. Um, the rule does not work backwards. And what I mean by that is this. If you have a final and appealable order and you file a notice of appeal, the clock stops ticking. Things may still be going on in circuit court post-judgment, but the jurisdiction of the appellate court stops on the date of the notice of appeal. We can't consider orders that were entered after the notice of appeal. And we see this surprisingly frequently, where an appeal has been perfected, there is a notice of appeal, there's a briefing schedule. In the middle of briefing in the appellate court, things are now happening, or still happening, back in the circuit court that somebody doesn't like, they throw it into their brief. That doesn't work because it's not covered by the notice of appeal. What you need to do is file a second notice of appeal, assuming that that order is, of course, final and appealable on its own merits, back at that notice of appeal, and then move to consolidate the second appeal with the first one. After the appellate court issues a dispositional order, which normally would be an opinion, a Rule 23 order, or a summary order, or it could be the denial of the rehearing after someone has lost in the appellate court. There's a 21-day clock. We lose jurisdiction. So once the appellate court issues that opinion, 21 days afterwards, we lose jurisdiction. And we have uh, the unfortunate occasion to see attorneys and particularly self-represented litigants who believe that this is circuit court and perhaps 29 days afterwards or 30 days or four months afterwards, they come back to us and say, I, I want the court to vacate this, change this, modify it, reconsider it. No matter how compelling the reasons, we do not have the authority to do that 21 days after we issue the dispositional order. The mandate of the court will issue in due course back to the circuit court, uh, again, telling the circuit court what to do. And you cannot go back to the circuit court to implement the appellate court's order before that mandate issues. In specific cases, if there is an emergency need to go back to the circuit court right away, then you can always ask the appellate court by motion to issue the mandate in stanter or more quickly. Uh, but the court is unlikely to do this unless the other side agrees. The record on appeal is prepared by the clerk of the circuit court. Paper being what it is, sometimes it gets lost. And it's important to proofread the record that is prepared by the clerk of the circuit court 
before you submit it to the appellate court. Um, or if it's electronically transmitted by the clerk of the circuit court, once it has been transmitted and it's available to you electronically, proofread it at that point. Make sure that it includes everything that you believe is necessary for your appeal. The worst thing to happen is to go through the appeal, write the briefs, have it submitted, and then have the court tell you you're appealing the order of April 2, but it's not in the record. Supplement or correct the record if needed. Work with the clerk of the circuit court to get that accomplished. Also, keep in mind that the circuit court has continuing jurisdiction over all matters pertaining to the record, regardless of whether there has been a properly perfected appeal. So, for instance, if you are the appellee, you're the side that won in the circuit court, and you believe that something is missing from the record that you want to cite to the appellate court to help convince the appellate court why you should win. And the other side, the appellant says, I don't care, I'm not supplementing it, then you go to the circuit court and get an order to supplement the record so that material is then before the appellate court. And it's particularly important to include transcripts of trials or evidentiary hearings where witnesses have testified because we cannot rely on what the attorneys say so with respect to what someone said on a witness stand. If there was no court reporter present, then you can provide a bystander's report, but you should read the rules to see how that is prepared. The bystander's report needs to be agreed to and approved by the court and not be argumentative. In civil cases currently, the records will come in electronically. In criminal cases, you might still have the need for a paper record. Those will be bound and certified by the circuit court clerk. What you cannot do and what you could not do before the electronic age is you could not stick material at the back of your brief and say, here are some orders that were entered. They're not in the record, so we're going to give them to you. Or here are some orders that were entered after the record was prepared. That doesn't work. We cannot rely on material that is not certified by the circuit court clerk. If you have several appeals emanating from the same circuit court case, make sure you ask to file a single consolidated record so that everything is together. I'm now going to discuss some hints about brief writing in the appellate court. The contents of an appellate court brief are specified by the Illinois Supreme Court rules. If you have not prepared an appellate court brief before, or if the only brief you've prepared is something you did in moot court in law school, it's very important not to rely on your reading of the rules alone. Simply go to an internet search engine and do a search for the words Illinois Appellate Court Brief. You will instantly find a number of very good briefs that are prepared by prestigious and skilled attorneys that do contain the content required by the Illinois Supreme Court rules. Use those briefs as a model. If something is in those briefs, use it to make sure that your content is complete. But remember, there are page li or word limits on the briefs, and it's called a brief for a reason. Some portions of the brief are meant to aid the court in determining what is before it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Those portions are not the place to argue your case. The place to argue the case is instead in the argument portion of the brief. Also, be aware that there is a book called the Illinois Supreme Court Style Manual. It's available on, in electronic form on the Illinois Courts website. And it is a book that my law clerks and I use all the time because it dictates not the elements of our opinions or elements of briefs that you will write, but things such as italicization, punctuation, capitalization, what words 
are in Latin are italicized, what words are not. Things like that that are used in a style manual. Um, we use that all the time. And if you read the opinions of the Illinois Appellate Court and the Illinois Supreme Court, you'll notice that they're all written with the same style of capitalization and punctuation. And it's important to follow those guidelines because they help make your work more readable and understandable. Similarly, if you are going to cite a case as authority for a proposition, do not merely cite the first page of the case in the bound volume, but use pinpoint cites to the actual proposition that you're citing. Similarly, if you are citing to the record, and you need to cite to page 2012 of the record, the, in older cases particularly, the record may be broken up into a number of volumes. The, the judge or the law clerk working with your brief might not know whether page 2012 is in volume 18 or 21 or 72 or 3. So use um, a style that provides both the volume and the page of the record where the, volume, where the record is broken up into volumes. Now let's talk about the appendix to your brief. The appellant is required to provide an appendix to the brief containing certain material, such as the notice of appeal and the order being appealed from. If the material you are citing is in the appendix, make sure you cite to the appendix because the appendix is right in front of the, in the, of the judge, whereas the record might not be readily available at that moment. So for instance, you might want to say something like, on May 1, 2015, the circuit court entered summary judgment in favor of Acme Company and against John Doe. Appendix page 3, comma, record page 1075. That way, regardless of which resource the judge has before himself or herself, the judge can go to the appropriate page and refer to the document you're citing. This slide again recites those items. Certain items are required. It may be helpful to include some other things in your appendix. One example is this. If the case was dismissed on a 2615 motion, as we all know, that motion looks at the four corners of the complaint. It may be helpful to include the complaint in the appendix if it's not too voluminous. That's what I mean by when I say a key pleading. If there is a key testimony of one witness that's not too voluminous, you might want to include that. Particularly helpful is a photograph or a diagram or a map in a case involving who owns a piece of property. When there's a dispute about a boundary of, a, of land, a diagram may be very helpful to have right in the appendix so the judge can refer to it immediately. Similarly, if there's a key law, statute, a constitutional provision, those would be included at the front of your brief in the manner provided by the Supreme Court rules. But what isn't helpful is this. Please don't give the appellate court five extra volumes of appendices, including virtually every pleading ever filed in the case. Those just have to get lugged around and they're not helpful because they're, they really are duplicative of what's in the record already. One other example is this. Imagine a case involving a dispute over a shopping center lease. And the shopping center lease is 120 pages long because it includes all sorts of provisions and diagrams and formulas about who pays the taxes. And the case is all about that lease. And it's attached to the complaint and it's attached to every motion ever filed in the case because everybody's arguing about the shopping center lease. It's helpful to give the court perhaps one copy of the lease in the appendix, but if other, other pleadings also have the same attachment, you could simply put a dummy page in and say, at this point, the motion for summary judgment also provided a copy of the shopping center lease. And again, it's less to lug around 
and it's easier to use. We're now going to talk about some tips for writing your appellate court brief. Look at this example. Which is better? Do we want to say, it was ordered by the circuit court that the husband's Apple stock be transferred to the wife? Or, the circuit court ordered the husband to transfer his Apple stock to his wife. There's about five less words in the second version, and if you remember from grammar class in grade school or high school, the difference is the first sentence is written in the passive voice, and the second is written in the active voice. Right? Who is the actor in both sentences? The actor is the circuit court. The circuit court is ordering something. Make the circuit court the subject of the sentence and indicate what the circuit court is doing. It's much more readable. Here's a few more points. First one, don't use Esquire when referring to your own name or the names of your law associates or partners. It's an archaic and pretentious habit, and lawyers should have stopped doing it about 50 years ago. Unfortunately, some lawyers still do it. You're not going to lose your appeal because you do it, but it just is something that you should get in the habit of omitting. Similarly, when you write court orders, avoid legalese, avoid the medieval terms such as it is hereby ordered and adjudged and decreed by the court. I, I can challenge you that you can go through all of American jurisprudence going back to the 1700s and never find a single instance where something didn't happen because a court only ordered it to happen, but did not also adjudge it to happen or decree it to happen. Simply say, the court ordered, or the court orders. Here's some more examples of what we call legalese. Terms like instant case, uh, obscure words like vacators, and phrases like the second example here about antecedent trial and appellate record repristinations. I can go on there and read it to you, but try to use simple, straightforward language. It's much more convincing, and it helps if the judge does not have to walk away from her desk and go get a dictionary to understand what you're saying in your brief. Some common spelling and grammar and punctuation issues that we see all too constantly. Um, learn how to use apostrophes. First example, the plaintiffs contend that. There's no possessive. Get rid of the apostrophe. Next sentence, there is a possessive. The car belonged to the defendants, so you want to use the apostrophe in the correct place. Um, between the T and the S, if it's one defendant, or after the S, if there's more than one defendant who owned the car jointly. Another one that's astonishingly frequent is the two terms, uh, two uses of the word principal. Um, if a school has a principal with an AL, um, a doctrine is a principal with an LE, all four examples on the slide are wrong. So be careful of, of your grammar and punctuation. It's a dead giveaway that the lawyer was sloppy. And if you're sloppy in things such as spelling and apostrophes, we figure you're probably going to be sloppy in your legal analysis as well. Use the Supreme Court style manual, and you'll notice that terms like plaintiff, defendant, trial judge, opinion, those are not proper nouns, so they should all be lowercase. Again, the examples on this slide in red are all wrong. Except for proper nouns, lowercase is usually correct. Look at the opinions issued by the Illinois Supreme Court, which are edited by a team of people before they are issued. They are very well written and do not have these kinds of errors. Just look through one of those opinions for examples on how to use words, and you will be home free. I want to give you another example here. One of the requirements for an appellate court brief is to provide the court with a brief recitation of the nature of the case. This is an example where you don't argue your case. The purpose of that paragraph, and it should be one brief paragraph, is simply to tell the court 
what it's walking into. Is it a divorce case? Is it an adoption case? What is it? And what is really before the court to decide? This slide has two examples. Look at the example on the left. It's full of verbiage that's unique to the legal world. It's got a Roman numeral in it. It has a statute cited in it. It really isn't helpful. A judge will read this and say, okay, what is this? Is it, is it a tax case? Is it a personal injury case? I don't know what's going on. The example on the right is terrific. First sentence, six words. This is an insurance coverage case. Bingo. The judge knows what's going on. Second sentence, no legalese. The plaintiff, Allstate Insurance, appeals from the dismissal of its complaint, seeking a declaratory judgment that it did not owe its insured coverage under a liability policy. The entire case is in those 20 or so words, and the judge, who undoubtedly has seen a lot of insurance coverage cases in his or her career, knows exactly what to read for, what to look for, and what cases are going to be cited, and what the standard review is going to be. Use the second example rather than the one on the left. The next example is typography. There's, there are books out, and there's a, really an excellent book about typography for lawyers. Appellate court judges have to read a lot, and they have to read a lot of technical, detailed prose, some of which is very badly written, unfortunately. And putting it in, in a format that's easy to read makes it more understandable. Look at these two examples. The text on the left is written with a font that has serifs. Serifs are those little points at the end of letters. Anyone in the business will tell you that reading text printed in a font with serifs is easier than reading text printed in a font that doesn't have serifs. Fonts with serifs are intended for dense text, such as newspapers, books, and legal briefs. They're easier to read on the eye. The text on the right is written in what's called a display font. It's intended for logos and for advertising and for headlines. The other problem with the text on the right is it bounces back and forth between italics, boldface, and underlying. The only thing that should be italicized in your appellate court brief are names of cases and terms from a foreign language. Underlining is really not necessary anywhere, and boldface, similarly, is really not necessary anywhere. I might make an exception. If you really need to emphasize a particular word to distinguish it from another word, such as saying that this was in Smith's argument rather than Brown's argument, it might be helpful to italicize in that context, but it would be a very rare situation. Here's another example of what I call the roller coaster style of appellate brief writing. Look at the example on the right. Some people were taught in law school, or perhaps not taught in law school, but learned from a mentor attorney, that whenever you use the word plaintiff or defendant or the name of a party, you should capitalize it. Don't do that. It's not correct, and it makes it harder to read. Printing material that is in all capital letters is intended for headlines. It's intended for advertising. It's not intended for text. Use the example on the left and you will be fine. Use the example on the right and you will give a judge a headache. So you know which one to use. To help win your case, your arguments need to be effective. Part of making an effective argument is first of all, don't use string cites. We see many briefs where there's a proposition of law cited that no one could possibly argue about. For instance, 
the point of law could be that when you're reviewing a decision on summary judgment, the appellate court reviews the case de novo. Every justice on the appellate court knows about that doctrine. You do need to put it in your brief so we have it, but you don't need to cite 20 cases for that proposition. One is enough. Similarly, it's very helpful, rely on Illinois Supreme Court precedents if at all possible. Don't rely on the first case that pops up on a Westlaw search, which might be from a different district's appellate court from 30 years ago, or even, heaven forbid, an out-of-state case. The appellate court of Illinois must follow the Illinois Supreme Court regardless of how old the decision is, assuming it has not been overruled by the Supreme Court. So whenever citing a proposition of a law, dig down and find a Supreme Court case, because then the appellate court will know that that proposition of law is binding. Additionally, there's no need to cite to the privately published reporters, such as Northeast Second or Illinois Decisions. The chambers of the justices have only the official reports, which would be volumes such as Illinois Second or Illinois Appellate Third, or for the newer cases, the internet-based official reporters, which is the capital I, capital L reporters. Use those because that's what the judge will be looking at. Again, avoid technical jargon and acronyms. It's crucial to be honest with your statement of facts. Every justice that I know on the appellate court, while relying strongly on the briefs, when, will, when writing the opinion, rely on the record for quotes and testimony and events. There are many examples where there was a trial and the appellant will give us a statement of facts and I'll read the appellant's statement of facts and I'll think, wow, how could that appellant possibly have lost that case? They had all the evidence on their side. It was convincing, it was thorough, it was complete. What, what, what went wrong with the circuit court judge? Was the circuit court judge perhaps having a bad day? And then I look at the blue brief and they have a counter statement of facts, which lo and behold, includes the testimony of three witnesses who completely undermined the appellant's case at the trial, but they were never mentioned in the white brief. That is really a problem. And if you pull that stunt as an appellant, you are going to be criticized strongly by the appellate court. It is your job as the appellant to give a fair overview of the entire case in the circuit court, including things that affected your client negatively. It is not necessary to give us every last thing that happened in the circuit court if, it's, if things are not necessary to resolve the appeal. For instance, if there were several extensions of time granted, we don't need to know about that unless um, you're asking us to, that the court have used its discretion in granting those extensions. We care about the merits of the appeal and the issues actually framed in the appeal. You don't have to shout at the court by using capitalization or boldface and provide citations to authority for every point you're arguing. We dismiss a surprising number of appeals because something is merely argued with no authority cited for it. For instance, an appellant will say, the court was wrong by failing to give credit to the testimony of the witness who said this and or failing uh, the circuit court erred by giving credence to a certain witness, but then there's no authority cited to it. Um, there are standards to review for those kinds of arguments. Make sure you dig them out and use them. Another thing is to think outside the box when you write your brief. We live in an electronic age and there are a number of resources available in word processing programs that allow you to use things in your briefs other than straight text. It could be a photograph, it could be a graphic, or a map. The example on the slide was a case involving insurance coverage over the 
whether or not a particular way artistic markers were displayed in art stores was covered under the insurance policy. Trying to describe the specific features of the shape of the markers and the slant of how they fit into the slots was very difficult to do in text, but as we say, a picture tells uh, uh, a thousand words. So the picture was in the brief, and we put it actually in our dispositional order. Another inventive use of graphics would be a case where there are five layers of insurance, and they're all fighting with each other as to who actually has to cover the underlying claim. It might be helpful to set those five insurance policies out in little boxes with arrows pointing, with the different coverage limits indicated, um, with some explanatory text. The next two practice tips are really intended for circuit court, but I'll include them in the presentation today nonetheless. One thing we see misused all the time are attorneys who don't know the difference between affirmative defenses and counterclaims. An affirmative defense is something that stops the plaintiff from winning its otherwise good case. An affirmative defense does not give a defendant any money or relief such as an injunction. You cannot plead an affirmative defense that says, et cetera, et cetera, wherefore the defendant wants a million dollars. That's not an affirmative defense. An affirmative defense prayer for relief would simply be, wherefore the defendant should prevail against the plaintiff's claim. A counterclaim is what a defendant files to get affirmative relief such as monetary damages or an injunction. Those are two different pleadings. There is a, they have different purposes. Secondly, another pet peeve of mine is the term cross-claim. In Illinois state courts, there are no such thing as cross-claims. I know we learned about cross-claims in civil procedure class in law school. Guess what? There are cross-claims in federal court. They are, in fact, recognized by the federal code of civil procedure and federal court rules, and they are what are used when one defendant in a federal case wants to sue another defendant in the same federal case. If that occurs in an Illinois state case, it's called a counterclaim, regardless of the fact that the plaintiff is not involved as a party to that claim. So be careful about using those terms. Similarly, particularly in the appellate court, where you may have a, a complicated case that's been fully briefed and is under advisement by the court, if there are a number of parties and the case is still in the circuit court going on and something has happened regarding a pretending pending or impending settlement, please call the court clerk and let the court clerk know or prepare a filing and give the court a heads up to say, perhaps this case could be put on park for a while on hold because the parties are very close to a settlement because of mediation, a litigation pending in another state or county, because there is nothing that will distress a judge more than working on a case for one or two weeks, writing it, rewriting it, researching it, and then finding out at the very end, one day before the case is going to be issued, that the case has been settled. Um, we can't do anything about that. We certainly encourage settlements, but if that's going to happen, it might help the judge in terms of traffic control in his or her chambers to deprioritize that case for a while if, in fact, it might settle. Another thing is, there's no need to spell out numbers in words. Simply using the numbers is fine. Uh, it's not like writing a check, and it just takes up space, and it's difficult to read. I hope you found the presentation helpful. The appellate court is a very important structure in our judicial system, and the justices of our court try very hard to achieve the correct result in every case. Helping us achieve that result is the work of lawyers who prepare their cases thoroughly and according to the rules promulgated by the Illinois Supreme Court. Thank you again for participating in this presentation.